Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Combating High Moisture Conditions with Mape Patches. We have some brief housekeeping before we start. Your phones are on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box in the corner of your screen and we'll answer them at the end of today's session, time permitting, or via an email after. And you can always send questions to Mape Digital at mape.com. Now, without further delays, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Jeff Johnson. Jeff is the business manager for Mape's floor covering and installation systems line. He brings to the industry more than 30 years experience in the development and marketing of floor covering installation products. His practical experience in the construction industry and as a bench chemist give Jeff an insightful perspective on surface preparation, moisture mitigation, and floor covering installation. And with that, Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jen. And uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule and day to spend some time with us and talking about high moisture conditions and MAPE patches. First of all, let me just make sure we're clear on, on the scope of this project that we're not talking about patching materials to go on your raincoats to deal with a rainstorm. We're going to be talking a little bit about patching compounds as used in the floor covering installation world. So uh, certainly this is a great opportunity for you to learn about some of our product solutions for that, but it's also a great opportunity to ask some questions. So I do uh, encourage you to take advantage of the chat window uh, on the side there. If I catch the question, I might try to answer it during the process, but Jen, I think we'll certainly get back to those questions at the end of the presentation. We'll make sure you get as good an answer as I can come up with for that. Um, in the meantime, also, I do want to remind you that there's a lot of great information on our website at www.mapay.com. Um, a lot of these information I'll be sharing with you today is available on our technical bulletin, technical technical data sheets, um, brochures, and other uh, documentation that we have on the website, okay? So having said all that, uh, what are we talking about? Um, and sorry for this picture, but that is the scope of what we're gonna be talking about, patching concrete, patching or skim coating concrete, one of the most common substrates for uh, us in the FCIS business. We do an awful lot of work in commercial environments and some even residential where our starting point is a concrete slab. And this picture that you're seeing in front of the screen is probably pretty typical of what you would see on a normal day job with footprints and taco sauce and all this other kind of garbage that's on that slab and that you'll somehow rather need to put some kind of a flooring material on top of it. So at some point that slab can be your best friend. It can be a perfect condition, pristine, fresh, porous, and all that kind of stuff. Or it can be your worst nightmare. It can be uh, all kinds of contaminants and other different kinds of conditions that will make your life miserable. So the difference between that good dog, bad dog thing, I apologize for the imagery, but it seems to make sense to me that a, a concrete slab that uh, in some cases, in some respects on industry is very hard to find, is a concrete slab according built according to ASTM F710. Um, and if you don't have a copy of that ASTM on file, I would encourage you to go get it because that is the guidelines for concrete construction for resilient flooring which we do an awful lot of business in, uh, and gives you a lot of great information in there about uh, underslab moisture barriers, compression strengths, dryness and flatness and all that kind of stuff. So um, theoretically, new construction these days is supposed to be made according to the ASTM F710 or another standard that's called the American Concrete Institute ACI 302-2 underscore six. Both of those are great um, documents to have on file that tell you 
uh, for basically how the concrete slab is supposed to be poured. And when we get into it, when we're talking about high moisture conditions, a concrete slab that is your best friend is not high moisture. It's a less than three pounds of moisture vapor emission rate per uh, the F ASTM F1869 test or an RH level of less than 75% using the ASTM F2170. Again, these are almost, I should use a unicorn for these kind of this kind of a picture. They're very hard to find. And what most of us deal with these days are the concrete slabs of unknown origin. Uh, they're a menace. You can almost hear that Jaws theme in the background when you walk on the job site. Dun, 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 dun. You know, what are you going to get into when you take a look at the concrete slab? You don't know how it was made. You don't know how old it was. Uh, when you do some moisture testing, the, you're pegging the charts off the moisture vapor emission rates and your RH levels are 99%. So the course of this presentation, we're going to be spending most of our time talking about the danger zones or those concrete slabs that are higher moisture content. A little bit of um, refrains or preaching or choruses to the choir. Um, you know, there are two test methods that we use for determining um, moisture content of a concrete slab. You cannot essentially tell by a visual examination whether or not a concrete is dry or wet by looking at it. So there are two test methods that we in the industry endorse and support that give some idea of what kind of condition that slab is in terms of moisture that's left in the slab. The AST, ASTM F1869 is perhaps the older, more traditional method for determining moisture vapor emission rates. This is what we call the calcium chloride test. This is um, the little uh, Petri dish of calcium chloride that we put underneath a dome, plastic dome, and you let it sit there for three days on top of a concrete slab, come back and record the measurements. And that gives you uh, a term, a number that says at what rate the water is evaporating out of that slab over a thousand square foot area over a 24 period, 24 hour period. So this really is giving you rate of evaporation information. Now, the important thing to note about that, in my opinion, is that once you cover it with an impervious floor covering, whether it's even carpet tile or uh, sheet vinyl or rubber or so on and so forth, you crimp down the valve on that evaporation rate. So the rate basically goes to zero and whatever moisture was in there is probably going to still stay there. Uh, yes, you'll get some migration of moisture vapor around seams and cracks or gaps in the flooring installation, but for the most part, you shut the valve on the evaporation rate and you're left with whatever's left in the slab. And that's kind of what the ASTM F2170 really does. And that basically gives you the state of the humidity, not a rate per se, but it's at the state. What is the condition of the moisture level in that concrete slab? And there's a lot of great presentations, a lot of information about both of these tests. I would encourage both of you to, all of you to, to study up on these uh, test methods as well. But they can, they give you a better indication of what that slab is going to be like in terms of its humidity condition once you do cover it. Now, again, all of these TEF methods are recommended for use on concrete slabs poured according to the ASTM F710, which means you're supposed to have an un under slab moisture barrier under the concrete. You're supposed to do it when the HVA systems are running and the temperature is supposed to be 72 degrees Fahrenheit and so on. So um, again, what the 2170 will tell you if you get high numbers on that, Again, which we are focusing here on high moisture content, you get 99s or 90% and above, um, could indicate that you have a green slab. That means it's relatively young, five days, seven days old, concrete is a high number. Um, sometimes you can see the presence of cure and seal compounds on the top of that concrete. Concrete, when it's placed, typically gets some sort of a, a cure and seal material on the surface to retard the amount of moisture coming off of it. 
um, the way reason why they do that is to prevent or try to control that concrete slab from curling. So they lock the moisture in to try to keep that um, moisture in there to stabilize the concrete slab. Now the reason why is high polished con high polished surfaces. Um, I've seen, I'm sure many of you have seen concrete slabs that are almost black uh, and glossy, um, polished with a motorized um, polishing equipment just to get a nice smooth surface. That's going to block up all the capillaries, um, allowing for, that would normally allow for moisture vapor emission to leave. Um, that's going to keep it in the concrete slab and keep the RH high. Fly ash does the same thing. It kind of blocks all the capillaries and keeps it from um, excuse me, keeps it from keeps the moisture from moving out of the slab as well. Perforations in the under slab moisture barrier um, are often a nightmare uh, to the flooring manufacturers. The guys placing the concrete decide to use their shovels and poke a few holes in that under slab moisture barrier to allow the concrete to cure faster. And of course, topical water, floods, rainstorms, and so on. Low numbers can indicate an aged concrete and maybe a highly porous slab. Lightweight concrete oftentimes breathes much easier. Again, in my opinion, these RH numbers are more relative. It's because that's what we're going to deal with. That's the condition we're going to deal with once we cover that slab with a flooring material. Again, this is more relative for impervious flooring, uh, resilient flooring perhaps not as terribly relative for a porous flooring like an action back carpet. But um, since we're dealing kind of with this resilient flooring market these days is, is a, a high level of interest, um, that's kind of important to us. So what does this all matter? I mean, I don't know how many of you, uh, like myself, have attended an awful lot of uh, moisture and concrete seminars and symposiums and people make a, a good living talking about moisture vapor transmission presence of moisture in concrete slab and how it it affects floor covering insulation well, what it affects it is because we have to install on it we have to put things on it in order to finish the job um, i assume that wherever you are looking at this webinar you're in an, a building hopefully, uh, on a floor, and underneath that floor is some sort of a construct um, that supports that flooring material. So what we need to take a look at is this perfect sandwich of all the elements that go together to make that work. So you've got a concrete slab, and I apologize if I'm talking about sandwiches for those of you who are in lunch period mode. <laughs> Um, I'm getting hungry myself just looking at this old diagram. So it tells you what kind of hunger I'm at. Anyway, it starts with a concrete slab, which is layer one, followed by subfloor preparation materials and adhesive products, a flooring material, maintenance material, and then your stuff, your office chairs, your furniture, your carpet rugs, and so on and so forth. Um, that's the perfect sandwich. You know, all those things need to work together in order to make the perfect Dagwood sub sandwich that we all enjoy. And when certain things change, then life doesn't work as well as you'd like to. So what's happening in the marketplace today is things are changing. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about glue. And I know you didn't sign up to hear about glue, but I need you to learn a little bit about glue because just like that perfect sandwich, and I'll use a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a perfect sandwich cons consists of the subfloor, the subfloor prep, the adhesive, and the flooring itself. And what we're focusing on is the peanut butter and jelly here, the peanut butter being the adhesive, the jelly being the subfloor prep. So bear with me with my food analogies, and we'll just talk about that. But what's happening is that our peanut butter is becoming a more higher performance, higher moisture resistant products available today. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about one of those in this, the next slide, but we're seeing now adhesives being recommended for use on concrete slabs that are up to 99% RH. 
They're high moisture resistance with up to 12 to 15 pounds of moisture vapor emission rates. They got great pH readings. Now, how they work, just so that I, so I've got an audience here, is that when you apply a PSA adhesive to a concrete slab, whether it's dry or damp, they're eventually going to evaporate, coalesce, and get down to a pure film of adhesive stickiness um, that is not going to re-emulsify under normal conditions when you cover it with a floor covering. Even if the slab is 99% moisture vapor emission, these adhesives are designed to withstand that kind of, of level. Uh, but it's still, you need to understand that concrete slab. You need to do your moisture testing to make sure that everything is in line with what's going to be installed on top of it. An example of that new product that we just introduced here recently is Ultrabond Eco 399. It's a heavy duty pressure sensitive multi flooring adhesive. And again, this one is designed to work on concrete slabs up to 15 pounds and 99% moisture. Uh, and a great product. This one is also, uh, since I've got an audience, I'll tell a little bit about this. Great grab, uh, I think six hours worth of working time, which is perfect for the installation of all kind of resilient sheet flooring, including and importantly, LVT, Luxury Vinyl Tile and Plank. Um, it's heavy rolling load resistant, aggressive grab. And one of the most important things is that it manages or helps to control the gapping, which is a known issue with a lot of LVT. I'm not telling you that you can install LVT in an unacclimated environment and think that the adhesive is going to solve all your problems. You still need to follow all the rules. Um, LVT and resilient flooring should be installed in the environment and the ambient temperature conditions in which the building is going to be maintained. Ideally, you should be installing flooring at 72 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit um, and not bringing it in from the cold and installing it all nice and tight and then turning the heaters on. That's not going to be a good solution for any kind of flooring. So 399 is going to help you control some of the gapping that might occur with a normal shrinkage of LVT. Uh, we also have other reactive adhesives that are inter being introduced now that are not only high moisture resistant, but they provide a moisture barrier as well. We've been doing this for many years now with products like uh, our wood adhesive line, Ultrabond Eco 995 and Ultrabond Eco 985, which work at maximum moisture levels of 25 pounds of moisture vapor emission rate and 100% RH and create a moisture barrier in the process protecting the wood floor and the moisture sensitive flooring that might be installed upon on the top of it. Uh, a new adhesive that we just introduced in that domain for resilient flooring is Ultrabond Eco MS for LVT. Again, our professional hybrid polymer adhesive for resilient flooring. This one is part of our shower system for LVT, but also a phenomenal adhesive for LVT and resilient flooring on high moisture concrete slabs. And this does not require a moisture uh, vapor barrier. It does uh, um, work extremely well for those kinds of things. Again, it's a wet lay situation rather than a pressure sense of like 399, uh, but it is a, a great product, heavy rolling load, high performance product for uh, LVT and resilient flooring installations going forward. And lastly, again, uh, we're introducing tape systems. If you're not familiar with this, I certainly uh, suggest you get with a MAPE representative about it or give me a call. We'll talk more about it. But we have tape systems, which are fully moisture loaded products, 25 pounds, 100% RH uh, products provide a moisture vapor barrier in the process, instant ins installation, and so on and so forth. So again, the industry, the reason why I'm bringing it all up to you is that the industry is moving towards adhesive systems, part of that sandwich, that are now fully moisture resistant. 25 pound, 100% is the pretty much the mark of what everything is going. So a lot of numbers floating around in the marketplace about different levels of moisture vapor emission rate. 
So how do we generate those or how do we substantiate or make our claims uh, uh, pay-wise as to whether or not a, an adhesive meets those requirements? Generally speaking, we use an, a, another ASTM test procedure internally called an ASTM D1151. And this is the standard practice for the effect of moisture and temperature on adhesive bonds. And it's a kind of a scientific, it's definitely a scientific process. Samples are assembled and aged under various humidity and uh, temperature conditions. And that's going to give us some idea as to whether or not an adhesive can withstand. Now, an adhesive can withstand those kinds of conditions. And that's why we can safely state that products like Eco 399 and Ultramont Eco MS for LVT uh, are suitable for use under the conditions of high moisture that we talked about. We also do some immersion tests, drop them in water, uh, various different levels of pH. We do them on slabs and in the field. Anyway, a lot of testing, environmental chambers are used for all this stuff. So it's really a scientific method to help us to deal with all that. Uh, these are some of the test conditions that we uh, put together and determine whether or not an adhesive degrades, enhances, remains the same during all of that uh, testing process. That's important since we're finishing up, I think, the discussion about the adhesives that we are clear that there are kind of two categories of high moisture resistant glues. One set of products are just simply moisture resistant <clears throat> in the fact that they offer no moisture vapor barrier to them. So if you are thinking about using any of these adhesives, and I don't think I have the whole list here that are moisture resistant to install a moisture sensitive flooring, you're probably gonna have a problem. The adhesive is gonna stand up just fine, but it's going to allow moisture to transmit through and may have some impact on the flooring that you're installing on top of it. Uh, on the other hand, we have a whole bunch of adhesives that are high moisture resistant and high moisture barrier products combined. Um, we mentioned a couple of those already, the Ultramont Eco MS for LVT, or 995 and 985 for wood, MRT for resilient flooring, and SRT again for resilient and sheet and for wood as well. Those are all high moisture resistant and uh, moisture barriers at the same time, okay? So why does this all matter, okay? Um, it's important that you understand that some part of this sandwich has now changed, uh, but not all the elements have changed. First of all, we've gone now to high moisture resistant or high moisture resistant and barrier adhesive products but the toast, the bread that we've been working on, is now a lot soggier than it used to be. So we need to figure out how to address that. So again, as I mentioned before, I'm sorry about the lunch analogies here with this sandwich of the perfect installation where we have peanut butter and jelly. You know, what now becomes the weakest link in this whole assembly? I have a sandwich made out of high moisture resistant adhesive and now this is uh, an opportunity for all of you to chime in and tell me what the fill in the blank should say on uh, resistant patches and skim coats. What should that number, what should that say? And hopefully you're gonna tell me why that should also be a high moisture resistant patch and skim coat. Congratulations, everybody gets a gold star. You're, you're ahead of the game if you understand that. The problem we deal with now is that we've got blinders on. And I think this is something I, I encourage you, if you're a contractor uh, or even one of our a sales rep or involved in the sales organization, we get focused on numbers. I, I do it myself. Everybody does it. We get focused on that adhesive number. It's 99%. I'm using it. And you don't think about the rest of the elements that went in to make that sandwich. You don't think about your prep products. You don't think about anything else involved in it. You just think, I got 99% glue, I'm good to go. So we need to be aware that, you know, we're dealing with traditional subfloor preparation products. Um, a lot of them were designed to work on that golden Labrador concrete slab at three pounds and 75%, three pounds MVR and 75% RH. 
And as we moved up the chart to get to that soggy toast analogy, some of these are just not going to work as well as you'd like them. And again, why they're not going to work as well, they may have a, a very high dispersible or re-emulsifiable dry po polymer content to them. Um, if, if they, I just want to mention how to explain this. If you can take a dry polymer and get it wet and get it installed on a concrete slab in your patch and then let it dry, but bring water back into the equation, that dispersible polymer is going to redissolve again. Sorry, that's uh, not necessarily what you want to get. So you need to be looking for products that are specifically designed to work at a higher moisture level on this concrete slab uh, if you're going to be using these high moisture concrete adhesive systems. So what happens to these traditional prep products? Um, under high moisture conditions, they're going to start getting softer. Uh, the abrasion resistant decreases, which is really not a huge issue if you're gonna cover it over with flooring, but if you're in the process of doing the work and you're dealing with a traditional patch compound on a wet slab like this, it may not be as hard as you want it to, and you'll, as you drag things across it, it will rub off or come off easier. The compression strengths will uh, decrease somewhat. Uh, that's not a good thing if you're running heavy rolling loads across the surface. Indentations can happen. In the worst case scenario, some expansion can happen, causing swelling, delamination, and essentially uh, wood floor uh, fail, fail, flooring failures in the process. So now we're getting back to the combating solution. How do we fight? high moisture concrete conditions um, with MEP hay patches. And since we're a Deerfield Beach company and spent some time on this beautiful water fishing as well, I thought the analogy was appropriate. How do we battle high moisture concrete slabs? And with that, we turn to the tools that we have and the products that we have uh, to solve these kind of problems. I'm going to start off first and foremost with a, a go-to product that we have in our product line. This actually is part of our uh, CRS, the concrete restoration systems business, uh, but we use an awful lot of this in the floor covering industry. Mapachem Quick Patch is a high performance concrete patch. Now, it is a patch, not necessarily a skim coat. So, um, in terms of definition, a patching compound can be used in thick layers. Uh, we'll talk about it here as well. Mapachem Quick Patch can be installed from a 16th of an inch up to an inch and a half neat or deeper in small areas. Um, that's kind of what I would consider patching compounds. They need to be used in a thick layer. Skim coats, on the other hand, are designed to be skimmed over the surface. Typically, those things are not gonna be much more than a 16th of an inch, and they definitely need to be smooth enough that you can feather them out to zero. So skim coats are definitely thin, and uh, patching compounds are applied a little bit thicker. Uh, Mapachem Quick Patch is a, a sanded product, which makes it a little bit more difficult to get to that thin layer. And it's also sometimes not your last step. Because it is sanded, it does create a little bit of a rough surface. And if you're installing something like a, a two millimeter uh, rubber or sheet vinyl or resilient flooring on top of a an application quick patch, you might see the texture of that through the surface. So you might want to skim it with another high moisture product after you install it. But again, quick patch is a great product, uh, a lot of great track record, does a lot of deep fills. You can modify the water ratios to make it thinner for uh, wide applications, thicker if you wanna build up to make a ramp or transition. So it's got a lot of flexibility. It's designed to be used interior and exterior. So that means you can use this on uh, repairing a concrete step or a concrete deck outside. So it has all those wonderful benefits to it. Um, you can, so that's quick patch. If you have more information about that is available on our website for sure. Another product we have in the line that we've had out for a couple of years now is Planet Prep MRS, Meet the Misses. Uh, MRS is a moisture-resistant skim coat. Again, this is 
like Quick Patch in terms that it's uh, got all this hydraulic cement and it works extraordinarily well on high moisture concrete slabs, but it does not contain any sanding, sanded material. So you can apply this in a thinner layer application, smooth across the surface uh, to make a skim coat application over high moisture concrete slabs, okay? So that is Planet Prep MRS, can be used uh, without having any internal air conditioning controls in place. Uh, it is an interior use only product at this point, um, but it is uh, a great product for uh, fast track leveling and smoothing of interior floors that are high moisture concrete. And again, no moisture limits. I forgot to say this, it's a 25 pound, 100% solution but it can only be used in an application up to about, I think a quarter of an inch, we'll talk about that in a minute. A new one we just introduced is Planet Prep PSC, Patch and Skim Coat. So here is now another solution for floor prep and a high moisture consistent, a high moisture condition that is a fast drying product that can be feather edged and goes up to a one inch fill of thickness. And we'll put all this stuff in a chart at the end to hopefully make sure you get, get all that information out. But Planet Prep PSE is a very nice troweling material, high polymer modified, fiber reinforced, resistant to high moisture, fast drying. Um, I think uh, you'll be quite pleased when you look at the drying data that we preside, prevent on here in a little bit, uh, and definitely for smoothing and repairing interior floors on high moisture concrete slabs for the installation of floor finishes. Uh, I'm gonna tell you right now a little bit about Planet Prep PSC's future. Um, if you have seen the techno data sheet for PSC today, um, I'm gonna ask you to take a look at it again in about uh, two to three weeks. We are changing some of the positioning on PSC to be a more aggressive based on further data and, and research. Uh, this one is now going to have the same moisture limits as our MR. S product. It will be a 25 pound, 100% solution going forward. So uh, I do need for you to take a look at PSC going forward. One other product we have for high moisture concrete patch and skim coat, which is kind of new to everybody. This one was introduced uh, at the Surfaces Trade Show back in 2000. Oh, wow, 18, I think it was when we had a, an actual live technical. Uh, Surface trade show could have been 19. Sorry about that. Uh, as part of our shower system for LVT, uh, this is a one pre mixed uh, patching and skim coat product, excuse me, more of a skim coat and embossing leveler uh, that doesn't require the mixing of water. It comes ready to use uh, and is also designed <clears throat> for use on high moisture concrete slabs. Dries in about two hours, very quick drying, easy to sand very hard and very resilient and uh, definitely water resistant. So uh, keep that in mind um, if you're working on projects that are getting to be a little bit more snarky, it's not right word, but are more concerned about dust and mixing of dust uh, products on job site. Planet Prep for LVT is a material that can be used um, without mixing, ready to use out of the bucket close the lid and you still have material to use. It doesn't have a pot life like some of the other cement based materials going forward. <clears throat> uh, okay, so anyway, by the numbers, let's take a look at all these products uh, and they, how they compare. Again, Mapachem Quick Patch, minimum thickness is a 16th of an inch over the highest spot. Um, max thickness is three inches in small areas of 24 square feet. Uh, you have to wait uh, for about 16 hours before you can apply high moisture adhesive at the top of that. Uh, and you cannot use an embossing leveler, but it's a very strong and high compression stick product. Um, Planet Prep MRS is a feather edge to a quarter of an inch. We've got a little bit of a limit on that one. Uh, six hour dry time for moisture adhesive applications. Uh, I think MRS has a limit of two hours if you're putting a moisture controlling membrane on top of it, but six hours for glues. Can't use that for an embossing leveler and a pretty high compression strength. Planet Prep PSC, the one we just introduced or what we're talking about today is um, one inch to feather edge. 
very fast drying, 30 to 60 minutes. So that's going to be well received by the installer base, the, con uh, the contractor, no longer having to wait for um, high moisture adhesive applications. Uh, you can't use this as an embossing leveler, and it's still got a pretty good um, compression strength, which is above that 3,000 minimum requirement for ASTM F710. Planet Prep for LVT, as I mentioned before, is a feather edge to a very thin application. It's really a true skim coat and embossing leveler. Um, you're not really going to want to use this in very thick applications, but if you want to skim, that's a great product for it. You can apply adhesives on top of it within two hours, and you can use it for a, an embossing leveler. Uh, we don't have compression strength testing on this kind of data, uh, but it really is irrelevant anyway because it's a skim coat and a bossing leveler. Moisture vapor emission rates, as I mentioned before, Mapuchum Quick Patch has none because it's an exterior rated product. And being exterior rated, all those ASTM F1869, 2170 products don't comply. You can't do them outside. So we know that it works in high moisture conditions and freezing conditions and hot conditions and rain conditions and snow conditions, et cetera. Um, typically the application range is 45 to 85. You do need some porosity and texture of the concrete. Um, they're recommending anything from a CSP of one or three. And can you use this over wood substrates? The answer is no. Planet Prep MRS. Uh, again, you'll see where we are on that one, 25 pounds, 100%. We like some porosity, temperature range 40 to 90. Can't use it over wood because it just doesn't have any polymer. It's very brittle, designed for use specifically over concrete. PSC, on the other hand, enhanced characteristics, 25 pounds, 100%. 50 to 95 is the temperature range. Yes, we like to have some porosity when you're installing it on a concrete slab. And yes, you can also use this product over wood substrates, approved wood underlayments like exterior grade plywood, if you could afford to buy it these days. Uh, Planet Prep for LVT, a 12 pound 99% solution, 50 to 90%. Substrate requirements here are none. You can basically use this on non-porous substrates. We recommend it over waterproofing membranes. We recommend this over existing porcelain tile. Um, over a wide variety of substrates that have no porosity. So again, that's kind of why you have to apply it thin because it does have to evaporate in order to dry, um, but it can be used over a lot of different substrates, including wood. Word of caution, and I wanna make sure we're all kind of clear on this one, where I don't want you to use high moisture resistant virtually anything, are areas that are known osmotic blistering problems, and you'll know what these are. Contractor will call you and they'll say, I got water squirting out from underneath my floor. Um, that's really a problem child, and we need to have a conversation with our tech services department. Uh, I can help out a little bit with that as well. What's causing this problem? We don't want to deal with osmotic blistering. We don't want to deal with hydrostatic pressure issues where the water is literally oozing up from underneath the floor. Areas with known alkali silica reaction, not a very common problem in the flooring industry, but more in the exterior concrete application, but it's something we need to be aware of. Uh, we're not gonna be able to install this stuff in standing water. Folks, I know the contractors would love to be able to install flooring when the ceiling is not installed and it's raining outside. Come on, let's use some common sense here no standing water that dilutes everything it gets in the way of the bond strength and it's not a good situation and i'm going to caution you to avoid the use of these high moisture resistant skim coats and patches over old adhesive residue of any kind and the reason why i'm urging this caution is that you're dealing with a very moist environment and the Bond performance, the total the sandwich that needs to be made here needs to rely on a great bond between the substrate material, the adhesive material, and the substrate. And if you have some sort of ooey gooey adhesive residue on that concrete slab and you're still trying to make it work, that's gonna become your weakest link. It needs to be removed, abraded, ground off to get to a clean concrete if you're dealing with high moisture conditions. 
Now, having said that, if the concrete slab's got old glue residue on it and it's three pounds and 75%, I'm fine with using these products. But it's where we get into high moisture conditions that can create bond break situations that's uh, a concern for me. So that's the summary, and I hope you've been able to get uh, some good jewels of information uh, about MAPHM Quick Patch, Planet Prep MRS, Planet Prep PSC, and Planet Prep 4 LVT. And with that, I'm going to get back to my peanut butter and jelly sandwich and pass the baton perhaps off to Jen for uh, some questions that people might have. Jen? Hello. Hey Jeff, yeah, there are some questions, so don't uh, get yourself too gummed up with peanut butter there, okay? Okay. Okay, so the first question is, Jeff, how is fly ash content influencing F2170 readings? All right, so what's happening with fly ash is that it's it's a um, it's in kind of an environmentally good thing to put fly ash in concrete because it's a great way to get rid of it. It's a byproduct of coal burning power plants, um, but it is a glass like material that uh, polishes very tightly, and it really creates a very um, glass like surface on the concrete. It fills in the porosity, uh, fills in the microcapillaries of the concrete slab, and essentially locks all the moisture in a concrete slab uh, from breathing. So that's it basically that's what happens. It's a, a cork in the bottle. It's a stopper in the bottom of the tub. It just fills in those voids and keeps all the moisture in the concrete slab. It's perhaps it, it does make sense from a concrete construction to use it. Number one, it's a recycled product. Number two, it does keep the moisture in a concrete slab and controls the curling and all that kind of stuff. But it does create a very difficult product to bond to, very glassy, very non-porous, very slick. Um, but that's um, my understanding how that works. Now you can get away with certain levels of fly ash in a concrete slab. And I wanna say we have a technical bulletin online for this and I thought it was something like 20% addition by weight is the maximum levels we put in for a fly ash. It could be numbered, don't quote me on that. Uh, I would recommend you run through a search through our technical bulletins on fly ash because we do have some statements in there about that. Okay. All right, next question. MS4LVT, does it require an underslab moisture vapor retarder? No. Easily answered. <laughs> no. yeah, uh, ideally, yes. I mean, but you got to make sure the rest of those things are not a problem. Okay, um, you got to look for osmotic blistering. You got to look for hydrostatic pressure. You got to look for the evidence of pre-existing moisture vapor emission problems. Again, Planet Prep 4 LVT is not a moisture vapor barrier. It is a moisture resistant patch and skim coat. Okay. If you want to have a discussion about how to stop moisture transmission, you came to the wrong presentation. We're talking about products that just withstand high moisture conditions. And all these products that we talked about here withstand high moisture transmission, high moisture conditions, but they do not block them. Just want to make sure we're clear on that. Good. Okay. Got you. Here's a question. And it's I, I personally think it's a good one. Um, what does embossing leveling mean? Okay. Um, in the resilient world that I live in, you used to be able to buy, and you may still be able to buy this, cheap vinyl that kind of looked like ceramic tile. In other words, it had grout lines built into it. Even and in certain respects, if you have an existing tile floor, that you want to cover over with some resilient flooring like LVT. You have embossing in it. You have texture in it. Okay. Um, they, the flooring market, uh, when they made these things, had embossing wheels that would emboss a pattern onto the floor. If you don't fill in that embossing and put another resilient floor on top of it, the flooring on top will take 
uh, the, the bottom texture will telegraph through to the top. Hope you understand what I'm saying. So if you got a grout line or that's underneath the resilient flooring and you just glue the, the floor on top of it, you're gonna see where that grout line was. An embossing leveler fills all that texture to make it a very smooth surface. So again, keep in mind that resilient flooring conforms. It's resilient, it's, it's soft and rubbery and it's gonna wanna take the shape of what's underneath it. So if you're putting it on an existing flooring, whether it be ceramic tile with grout lines or an existing resilient flooring that has texture uh, on it, you'll need to use this Planet Prep 4 LVT <clears throat> as an embossing leveler to make it all smooth and flat so that when you put the new flooring in, it doesn't take on the texture of the old floor. Does that answer your question, I hope? I hope so. Um, good, okay. Here's a good one. Can you use gypsum patches on high moisture concrete? Yeah, hopefully everybody in the audience here knows that the answer to this is absolutely not. Um, you really don't want to get gypsum wet because gypsum cures by evaporation, not by hydration. Let's make sure we're clear about that. All the cement based stuff that we deal with today cures by hydration. It locks water up and becomes a non-water soluble material. Gypsum, on the other hand, dries by evaporation. The water leaves the system, and it, if it gets wet, it's going to fall apart. It's just like if you have a plaster cast on a broken arm, the doctor tells you don't get it wet. There's a reason. Um, not to mention the nasty biological stuff that can grow underneath it, but you don't want it to get soft. You're trying to keep it rigid. So the same thing is true for any kind of gypsum patches in the flooring market. They're not designed for use on high moisture conditions at all. Uh, so don't use them there, please. That's just uh, waiting for a trouble. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so I guess what happens if your substrate is gypcrete then and the moisture levels are high? Then you need to get a chair, sit back and wait for it to dry. <laughs> I mean, it, it, there's nothing you can do about a gypsum underlayment that's high moisture other than to let it evaporate and dry out. Um, and again, thin application. We have a variety of gypsum levelers in our line, and the recommendation here is if it's a thin coat, it dries pretty quickly. If it's a thick coat, uh, it takes a lot longer to, to dry. There are specific meters that we use to measure the dryness level of gypsum products and they need to be like less than 5% remaining humidity in, this, in that gypsum. Um, but there's nothing you can do. You need to let that moisture evaporate and get out of the system in order for the product to achieve its full performance. So please just sit back and let it dry. <laughs> Makes sense. All right. Ooh, here's a good one. Why don't you guys publish compression strength data for skim coat products like Planaprep SC? Um, good question. I get this question asked a lot. What's the compression strength of a skim coat? And I, I need you all to understand that a compression strength number is really important for things that are thick. You know, the test method itself uses a two inch cube in order to run the compression strength. And it's really kind of relative to things that are patches. It's not relative at all for something that you all use in a 64th of an inch layer or less. So that's why for the most part on many of our skim coat products, we are not providing compression strength data because it's not a relative question. Um, our patching compounds, on the other hand, where you're applying them thicker levels above a quarter of an inch, half an inch, an inch or two inches in depth, that does make sense because that's you're recreating the substrate that you're trying to match a 3,000 PSI number. But skim coats are, uh, what is that product that women use, a foundation or something just to fill in some minor... <laughs> Minor, sorry for, for doing that, but a minor defect, and it's not really structural by any means. 
caught me on that one. But that's kind of what it is, just <laughs> to smooth things out. It's not really designed to add any construction strength. So that's why we don't have um, compression data for skim coats. <laughs> Here's one. Can MapHM be used for a ramp application? Uh, MapHM Quick Patch can definitely be used for ramping applications. And I think we've got some good instructions on the technical data sheet on how to do that. I think it requires a slurry code to start with and then um, a creation of a thicker mass of MapHM Quick Patch to create the ramp. But absolutely one of the best products in the market for that. <clears throat> yes, you can. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well. Um, wait just a few more minutes and see if any more questions pop in. Oh, my hair's one more. Okay, do the high moisture and moisture barrier adhesives of 985, 995, and 4LVT provide the same warranty protection as planocil moisture membranes like VS, MSP, and PMB? Yes, to answer your question, they do. Um, the 995, 985 Ultrabond Eco MS for LVT are lifetime performance warranties as a standalone solution for the flooring that they install. Okay. You can get the same thing, yes, using Planisil VS, Planisil PMB. Um, and a urethane adhesive on top of them to install a wood flooring. Um, I, I think, uh, how do I explain that? Planisil BS is the gold standard for moisture vapor emission controls. It needs to be covered with uh, a primer and a leveler um, for the most part to get that properly installed. Um, MSP, on the other hand, I think is a lower warranty position than. Uh, VS, PMB, or the standalone moisture barrier botanic solutions on there. Uh, it's a good question. If you want to ask it a little bit more detail, we can talk about that offline, but I would certainly look at our best back warranty system on, again, on the website um, to get a good, better clarification of where we, how we extend our warranty on those kinds of products. But to confirm, the adhesives like 995, 985, and the Eco MS for LVT are standalone moisture vapor emission rate bonding solutions with a lifetime performance warranty. Good, thank you. Okay, I'll give people a little bit more time just to type, finish typing anything. Um, but if there are any other questions that come up uh, once we do conclude, um, they can always be sent to Mopay Digital at mopay.com and we will be sure to forward them on to Jeff uh, and we'll absolutely get any answers for you. Um, you know, and we also invite you to check out uh, the video library on our website, uh, www.mapay.com, as Jeff mentioned earlier, because there are a bunch of videos, uh, some of them actually do feature Mr. Johnson himself, uh, that explain a lot of information. And we do have some tech bulletins too. Um, oh, thanks, Jeff. People, <laughs> people are thanking you. And I thank you too, Jeff. It was a great presentation. And um, we thank everybody in the audience because we know uh, how busy your days are. And we really do appreciate that you spent some time with us today. Um, and I guess that will conclude today's presentation. So thank you. And until next time, have a great rest of your day. Bye.